Thank you, everyone. Um, sorry if I sound a bit rough. I've been pretty sick over the past two weeks. Uh, didn't help that I spent uh, two weeks in a very cold Sweden in uh, 30 centimeters of snow. Um, but yeah, I, um, I'm going to be, be speaking here today about my racing career. Uh, I've had a rather unusual racing career into esports, uh, quite the opposite of how most people would like to do it. Um, but yeah, it all started basically before I was born already because my family was into, um, into go-karting. Um, and I think that's, that, that happens a lot in, in racing. Uh, I think that's what happened with uh, Max Verstappen as well. Um, parents decide that um, they want their kids into, into karting. Um, and yeah, my, uh, my dad, uncle and uh, grandfather were all uh, into karting as a hobby. Um, and that's how it started off for me as well uh, in the, on the local uh, go-kart track um, at the age of four. I'd already been on um, go-kart tracks basically since I was born. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I grew up on this, in this environment of racing. Um, and then at the age of four, of course, started driving more and more. Um, at the age of four, you don't really know yet what you're doing, so you're not going to be very fast, of course. Um, I remember uh, my, my helmet was so much bigger than my entire body. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Then, um, of course, started practicing more and more. Um, eventually got into uh, the local championship um, at the age of 6-7. Uh, um, I got, uh, got into it a little bit uh, too early. Um, and, um, yeah, of course, in the beginning you're, you're going to be struggling, but you're going to be practicing a lot. Uh, in order to uh, to get up to the the local go kart uh, level, um, and um, as you can see there, this was me at the age of two, I think so, um, with my uh, Jarno Truly suit. Um, funnily enough, my name Jarno has nothing to do with Jarno Truly, but um, my mom chose it. So, um, yeah, that's uh, how it all started. This is me at the age of I think six or seven at the local uh, go kart track. Um, here I was already a lot bigger than when I started off at the age of four. And um, by now at the age of eight, nine, um, I was into the Dutch uh, championship karting. Um, and then this is my junior career later on. Anyway, um, when I was at the age of nine, I became the youngest uh, Dutch, Afro, uh, Dutch uh, champion karting uh, ever. Um, through, of course, a lot of practice and a lot of dedication uh, from my father. Um, I was very fortunate enough that I had a father who was um, so dedicated, um, because that's just how it is, of course. If you're nine, you can't go and decide yourself to uh, go in karting on the local track. Um, and my father pushed me really, really hard, I think, which is very necessary, which you hear a lot in racing, actually. Um, I think Max uh, Verstappen is the prime example of that. His father pushed incredibly hard. Uh, funnily enough, my, my father and... Uh, Jos um, were pretty good friends. They actually worked together um, in, a, in a construction of a, of a go-kart shop uh, before Jos was into uh, F1. Um, so yeah, my, fa my father already had a lot of experience before I even started go-karting um, with uh, a go-kart world champion, Bas Lammers. Um, he was mechanic frame for 20 years. So by the time um, I started, my dad already had a lot of experience. And that's what I mean with I was very fortunate enough um, to have a father who was so dedicated and so experienced already. Um, anyway, by the time I was 11, I um, was two-time uh, go-kart champion. Uh, and I had to move on uh, to the junior category, which is what you can see here, slightly bigger karts, uh, a lot harder physically. Um, and yeah, my, uh, of course, it was a lot more expensive as you move up to the ranks, which is uh, one of the biggest struggles in racing. Uh, as you go up the ranks, it's going to cost more and more, and um, you might eventually get stuck. Um, fortunately for me, I had a sponsor since I started, a very important sponsor, um, who, uh, who supported me basically until the very, very end of my real racing career. Um, and yeah, very fortunate enough to have him um, uh, along my career, of course, but um, you're going to need more and more sponsors as you move up to the ranks. So um, when I went into junior category, you can see more and more stickers um, come on, on the, on the go-kart. 
Um, and yeah, that's um, when I became uh, a three-time Dutch champion karting at the age of 12. Unfortunately, I couldn't uh, participate in the, in the Dutch, Dutch championship karting at the age of 11 because it was too early. Um, but yeah, then um, I went into shifter karts, which is um, the highest of the highest level uh, in go-karting. Uh, participated in German championship actually um, against the likes of Mick Schumacher, uh, who um, was in F1, he still is, kind of. Um, competed against Nikita Mazepin, Landon Norris um, on the world's highest level um, before I went into, uh, into the Formula cars uh, when I was 16. And that's where my sim racing journey actually started off. Um, as if you go into uh, in Formula cars, you don't have a lot of preparation uh, on the track because it is so expensive. You can't uh, go, go on track and have time to learn the track. You need to be on it straight away. Um, otherwise, you're not going to get really far. Uh, practice time is very limited in Formula 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, so you need to learn the tracks on the simulator. Um, and that's where it all started off. Um, and you basically, I think, before my first race in Formula 4 in Sochi during the Formula 1 World Weekend, I think I spent seven or eight complete days uh, on the simulator um, trying out the track. Because once you get there, you only get 15 minutes of, uh, of free practice, which is much, much less than real F1 has. So um, on that two-minute 15 track, you're only going to get six or seven laps in. And that's very scary, because um, heading into turn one at 200, 30 kph, um, you need to be on it from lap one, cold tires, um, and yeah, you can't be scared because um, you will be losing performance if you're scared. So um, if you break at 100 meters on the simulator, you're going to be breaking at 100 meters uh, in real life as well on the very first lap, and you're going to find out if it works the very first time when you arrive at turn one. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, very scary, of course. Um, but at the same time, you can't be uh, scared because uh, you'll be too slow. Simple as that. Um, and I think that's also a very strong uh, point that, uh, which, which Max has, um, of, of the younger generation has. Um, they have learned through sim racing uh, all these kind of different techniques, um, like pushing from lap one on cold tires. Um, and yeah, on the simulator, you can just endlessly practice uh, whatever technique you want to try in real life as well, even though it is obviously going to be different. Um, I think the two biggest differences are, of course, uh, no G-force and no um, perception of depth is a very big one, which people tend to forget. But yeah, on to my, my own career a little bit more again. Formula 4, my first year I finished second in the North European Championship. Um, through that I got picked up by the Renault F1 Junior team. Um, which then, uh, of course, helped me fund uh, myself into Formula Renault. Um, for unfortunately for me, I had a very bad season in Formula Renault. Uh, I was with a uh, brand new team uh, at the time, um, together with two other rookie teammates, which makes it hard to really um, yeah, get somewhere with setup and driving style, um, which you really need in racing, because there's so many different uh, perceptions of how you need to set up the car and how you need to drive, and every single thing you change in uh, on the driving, of course, has an influence on the setup. So um, again, that's also something um, that can help with sim racing, uh, create these different kind of perceptions of how you set up the car. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, didn't make it through into uh, Formula 3 and Formula 2. Um, one of the reasons was I lost my backing from the Renault F1 junior team um, because I had a poor season. Uh, of course, the team was not great, but at the same time, as a driver, you have enough influence um, to, uh, to change those things within the team. Um, so yeah, that was a big learning moment and I think something that, um, that really helped me into sim racing as well um, and in future things in life. Um, because as you can see here, this is still go-karting. This was my Formula 4 in, in Spain. Um, a Spanish championship, I think so, which I only participated one or two rounds in. This was Formula Renault, uh, slightly faster cars, more downforce, etc. Um, um, but yeah, unfortunately not a great season. I didn't have the backing anymore, didn't uh, get enough sponsors to continue. And downgrading back to Formula 4 was not really an option as well. Um, so I decided to try and get into Formula 1 eSports uh, from there on. And this was 2017. 
uh, when I decided to try and get into F1 Esports. Um, and it took me quite long. I, I must say, I, I probably not the most talented uh, driver in the world, but um, I think my dedication very much helped me um, through to uh, succeed in esports eventually. Because I remember when I got into uh, esports, I was still a second uh, of the world champion after my first weeks of practice. Um, and, um, but fortunately, I kept, uh, kept being very dedicated, and which is exactly what you need in esports, because otherwise you're very simply not going to make it. Um, and yet this is uh, the Formula One race weekend in Silverstone. I'm here together with Daniel Ricciardo, uh, Nico Hülkenberg, and Cyril Abitable, um, previously team manager for uh, the Renault F1 team, which is now Alpine. Um, and yet this was my first year of um, F1 Esports in 2019. Um, so it actually took me almost uh, one and a half years before I um, got into F1 Esports because I previously failed to, to be good enough, simple, simple as that. Um, but yeah, then 2019 finished fourth. Unfortunately, I lost the championship with two races to go. Um, simply not quite up to the level of uh, esports yet. Of course, there were some people who have been doing it for 10, 15 years already, so my rookie season was always going to be very, very hard. 2020, though, uh, I managed to get my first F1 Esports World title. Um, and, yeah, it was, was very hard. Of course, it took a lot of hours. Uh, 2019, I made the mistake of uh, thinking that uh, driving as much laps as possible during the day was going to get me somewhere. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, you've got mental fatigue as well, and you just need to rest. Uh, driving laps for 12 hours per day was not going to work, um, which fortunately uh, helped me um, in, in my future career in esports, but also with other things as well. So um, yeah, that was a, a great lesson learned. Um, then I moved on to Mercedes, um, an even bigger team than Alfa Romeo. Um, and but it, it was probably a much harder season than the year before, simple because uh, the Mercedes team just went through a complete rebuild, um, which new people uh, and a new facility, so uh, it was very tough to uh, win this one, because um, it took so much dedication, and I think we were lucky enough that um, my experience through race strategy in real life um, helped us win this, because we were clearly not the fastest uh, in that year, um, and I think... I uh, was very lucky that um, I had real life experience, of course, in these uh, kind of scenarios to help me through. Um, and that's uh, what I said earlier on as well. A lot of people try to go from esports to real life. I did it the other way around. Um, and I think that's helped me a lot in esports. In real life, you, it's going to be very hard to be making a career for yourself because you're always going to have to bring through the budget, of course. Um, unless you can get with a manufacturer. Luckily, in eSports, there are a lot of manufacturers involved these days because um, they want to uh, hop on the growth of eSports um, and take their uh, advant advantage of it as well. Um, now a little bit more to the marketing side of things, which uh, I think you guys are a little bit more interesting in. Um, I was um, very smart to start my YouTube channel when I became uh, F1 World Champion, F1 eSports World Champion the first time. Um, basically within the week uh, after I became world champion uh, because I knew that if I wanted to start off a YouTube channel it had to be uh, right then um, after winning the, the, cha uh, the championship of course. I think a lot of people want to uh, of course watch the very best um, and I, decided, I realized that myself as well. So um, even though in the beginning I absolutely hated it um, because I was terrible at speaking in front of a camera and in crowds Luckily, I got better at it uh, through, uh, over, the, over the course of, of my life. Um, but um, yeah, in the beginning, I, I really hated it. But um, yeah, as I started doing it more and more and getting comfortable speaking in front of a camera, I, um, I started enjoying it, actually. Um, I really enjoy it. It is tough having to upload every day and still um, uh, practice enough for esports, of course, because esports is still my main job. Because um, a lot of content creators do it as their full-time job. And there are also a lot of F1 eSports drivers who have that as, your, as their full-time job. So um, creating content every day is very, very hard, but um, I really enjoy it. Um, I'm going to definitely continue doing it, of course, because uh, it also adds value to you as a, as a driver. Um, and yeah, I think it's just 
uh, very nice for, for the team and manufacturers as well, for the entire sim racing community if, um, if it has more impressions. So, um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed it.